Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig and I recently had the pleasure of chatting to actor Thomas Nicholson who recently enjoyed a guest stint on DC's Legends of Tomorrow playing none other than David Bowie. We talk about making the most out of life, getting in touch with his darker side and so much more. Sit back, relax and enjoy. I'm delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Thomas Nicholson or sometimes known as David Bowie. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well as well. So thanks for coming on. It's great to talk to someone that's been in Legends of Tomorrow, one of my favourite shows. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's just start with a bit about you. What made you get into acting and how did you get your start? What was your background like and getting to that, well, the point you're at now, really? I grew up in Denmark, actually, and I did a little bit of acting in Denmark, like in high school, some community theater and enjoyed it very much, but didn't think of it as a career opportunity. I didn't grow up knowing anyone who were actors, big fan of film and TV, but I always considered actors not exactly a different species, but I didn't think of that as a career path. And then I, I was a journalist for a couple of years in Denmark and in England, in London. And my partner and I moved to Vancouver. We kind of left behind kind of knowing we didn't want to do this kind of life for the rest of our working life. We ended up in Vancouver in December 2011. And she gave me acting classes as a kind of a Christmas present slash moving in present. And I was just hooked right away. First off, again, it was back to a hobby. And then it just grew on me more and more. There was a point where I became aware that I wanted to be a professional actor. I wanted to pursue it as a career, but it took me a while to kind of take that leap of faith and just jump into it and see what I could do. My mother has early onset Alzheimer's. After she was diagnosed, my parents just decided to fast forward their retirement plan. So their reaction to this horrible disease and to just like live life to the fullest and go traveling all they could and all this stuff and and have as much of a good time as they possibly could until they couldn't anymore was really inspiring to me. And I just felt like if they have that courage with that kind of diagnosis ahead of them, then what am I waiting for? And then I just really took it like a mental shift and just went like, okay, acting is my full-time job now. It wasn't as easy as that, but it was as simple as that. Yeah, so it was a mentality shift and then the rest kind of fell into place after. Yeah, exactly. It was a huge like mentality shift of, because, and I was in my late 20s at the time and felt like, oh, this is too light. I should have started 10 years ago or something like that. And just a mentality shift of just like, well, let's just, instead of thinking about doing it, just do it. And I did like a one year, they have a lot of different types of active programs in Vancouver. And I took one, yeah, that was just a year long one and very intensive full time studying for one year. And you kind of learn a little bit of everything. It's not like you come out and you've learned everything there is about acting in a year, but you do learn a little bit about everything. And it was just a great foundation to move into professional acting and auditioning for professional roles kind of thing. I'm the kind of person I want to keep learning, keep learning, keep improving, keep improving. So I continuously take classes depending on what I feel I need. And yeah, I I came out of that program in 2014, managed to sign with an agent. I'm not sure what the reality is like in the UK, but here to get into auditioning for professional roles, you have to have an agent. That's a necessary link to go out for shows like Legends of Tomorrow, for example. My first professional acting job was on The 100. I had a silent on camera, kind of a glorified extra role, if you will, and had one day on set for that and really just built from there, built a resume from there, built my experience from there, built my craft from there. You appeared on The 100 twice as two different characters as well, the two different roles. It did. They sometimes on these shows, especially if they go on for multiple seasons, because the first role I had, I didn't have any lines and it was just a, you know, a, I don't know, 15 seconds in one episode. And I <laughs> had a lot of makeup on, even hair extensions a tribal tattoo painted on me. So I I wasn't particularly recognizable in that. So occasionally the shows here will bring actors back if they feel like a significant enough amount of time has passed that the audience wouldn't recognize that same person as, oh, but he played this character in season two. So that was really cool to get back on the same show with a little bit more experience. Season two was my first episode. And then I came back for season six, I think. So 
a few years had gone by and I felt like a different actor and it was kind of a different show at that time as well. Yeah, different planet the next time you turn. Exactly. Yeah, it was almost like a reset of the storyline. And you're credited on your first one as Weak Grounder, which I think is a great credit just to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It must have been a blast getting put into all that makeup. I loved The 100. I always thought the world building was very intricate in the way that everybody looked and the, the different styles that they put the grounders in, for example. So that must have been an absolute blast getting put in that and becoming that. Yeah, and that was great too because... It, was, it wasn't like an advanced role in terms of acting skills. And that was great for one thing, because, you know, I was completely new and, and nervous and wanted to do a good job. So it's kind of great, at least for my kind of personality at the time, to start out with something that I felt like, I'm okay here. I can't fail in this particular role. I'll be fine. But then to have all this extra, I don't remember exactly, but probably three hours in makeup while three different people were doing makeup on my face and painting the tattoo to, you know, they want to do it as fast as they can. And then the sets for the hundred are really great. Everything that I worked on in the hundred is in a studio. And I think it was in the same building four seasons apart, but they looked completely different. Cause then when I came back, I was in this kind of a palace and as a weak grounder, yeah, I was rattling a cage. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a completely different set, even though it may have been in the exact same building even and it must be pretty surreal to kind of get lost in that science fiction world to be in there and have it be so different from our world i guess yeah one thing i really love about both sci-fi and period pieces i've been lucky to work on both i love that it's so different from my normal world that once i'm in my wardrobe and sometimes they do unusual stuff with my hair and then when I get to set, I feel like half the work is done for me because, it's you know, you literally step into a new world. Even just as a fan of those genres, it's great to be on those sets. And speaking of different world, you were in an alternate universe when you appeared in Supernatural. You were none other than Bobby Singer's son, Jim Beaver's son. What was that like? Yeah, that was great. And Jim Beaver's a great sense of humor. He's really fun to work with. And I was sort of a, an evil reincarnation of his presumed dead son and was dabbing him onto a tree it was set up so he was dangling on this tree and obviously jim the actor was safely hoisted up onto this tree just goofing around hanging on this tree between takes yeah it was super fun because both he and samantha that i had sort of an extension of the scene with were kind of veterans of the show veteran actors but also veterans of supernatural it's great when you come in and you do one episode to work with those actors they know the show inside out i follow them to figure out the tone if i'm a new character i'm not quite sure how i fit in i just kind of follow their not their direction but their lead in terms of how they're acting and the style they're acting in so yeah that was a lot of fun and it was kind of cool to be like a new surprising character to an already established very established character in jim beaver's character i've spoken to quite a few actors that have appeared in supernatural in varying sizes of roles it seems like well it's not on anymore but it almost seems like if you're on television you have to kind of cut your teeth by going through supernatural at some point you have to just get it on there well it's funny because especially here in vancouver because it filmed all 15 seasons here so there is kind of a running joke that that's like a rite of passage for any local <laughs> actor here to, to at least do an episode of supernatural <laughs> i'm glad to actually be one of the actors who got to do that it was a great show it was another show that i loved and it was great hearing about people's experiences working on it did you get any opportunity to meet jared and jensen when you were on or were you just dealing with bobby and so on i did meet jensen we were filming on the same day, but obviously I wasn't in any scenes with him. But I met Jensen in the makeup trailer when they were preparing me and he was just kind of wrapping up and he was great too. I mean, he's obviously one of the two main faces of the show and has directed episodes too, I believe. I admire it when the number one and the number two on shows take their time to make you feel welcome and he didn't have to say anything to me. It wouldn't have been rude for him not to, but he came up and shook my hand and say, hey, how are you doing? And welcome to the show. So I love that. That just give you the time of the day to make you feel like you're an important part of the show. Manners cost nothing. It's good to be friendly, make people feel part exactly. of the, the team or whatever. Yeah, so that, that's yeah. good to hear. I've heard nothing but good things about how they interacted with other actors as well and directors and so on. So yeah, same. I noticed early in your career, you did a lot of shorts or a few mm. shorts anyway. Was that a good way to learn how the, the acting business works and get experienced different things? That was great for me. And I actually did 
even more short, like student films that are not on IMDb, for example. I did tons and tons just to cut my teeth, learn what it's like to be on set, learn how to behave on set, learn how others behave on set. And in some cases, met other kind of up and coming people and not just actors, but also maybe filmmakers and stuff like that that I'm still in touch with now. And it was just great because then when I get to go on bigger shows or a movie, all the basics are the same. It's just the stakes are higher because it costs more money. And hopefully I'm a more skilled actor anyway. <laughs> but it's so great to have that because, you know, the first few times I've been on big sets, I'll get nervous. Actually, often I'll still get nervous going on set because there's always something new, whether it's new people I work with or a kind of character I haven't quite played before. And now it's the time to make it or break it. Once the camera's rolling, that's it. So I can still get nervous on set and often enjoy being nervous on set. But yeah, doing all those short films, it was such a great way to use my craft in front of the camera, get to see myself in front of the camera. I like watching my work back to learn from it. It's helpful to me to learn what kind of a film actor or TV actor I am just by watching myself. I take my work very seriously, but I try not to take myself so seriously that I can't watch myself. I know a lot of actors, they just won't, without like tearing my own work apart, it is very helpful to me to watch it. And same thing with those short films. Even if they're not paid roles on these short films, feeling like a working actor. It's a great confidence builder. Just getting used to the feeling and the surroundings of being on set, being around cameras, being around people that tell you what to do, that kind of thing. Yeah, and it's often relatively easy to do really well in a scene in a classroom setting because often the scene might be a Pulitzer winning play and the writing is fantastic. So you've got that going for you, but then also there's all the time you need and everyone is encouraging each other, at least if it's the kind of class that I like being in. All your surroundings are there to build up a good performance for you. Whereas sometimes on set, there's a lot of waiting, waiting, waiting. And it's like, okay, now perform now. You got to do it now. And once everything's ready to go, it, it'll cost a big production tens of thousands of dollars per probably every minute. So there's that kind of pressure situation. Even though the money is completely different in a short film, there's still the kind of thing of we have to get it in this take because we don't have time for any more takes. So there's you get to work under what can be stressful circumstances and still do your job. Another show you appeared on was The Haunting of Bly Manor, a big Netflix show. I mean, Netflix are killing it right now they're just making mm -hmm. everything they're everywhere i'm guessing the audition process was the same as it is for anything else but what was it like being on a kind of big netflix thing it was great and actually the audition process was slightly different for that because i had a scene i auditioned for and my character name in the audition was just wedding guest and there was a scene where i'm chatting with a bride at this wedding and it's just a very pleasant conversation at a wedding and that was all I knew at the time I auditioned. And then my agent contacted me and told me, there's an offer for you, and it's for this character, Older Miles. So that was the second part I knew, and I, I was a big fan of The Haunting of Hill House, the kind of season one of the show, so I was thrilled to just be involved in Bly Manor. And because I really wanted to be on the show, I'd done all the prep I could. I'd read the turn of the screw, the main story it's based on. And I knew that in the book, Miles dies as a young boy. So even at the time of booking the role, I was like, okay, I guess I'm older Miles, but maybe I'm a ghost. And I, I just didn't know until I got the scripts and then found out that they just changed part of the story. So that was really cool. And that was another one where, you know, I wasn't doing a lot in terms of acting. I didn't have lines. It was more about establishing that I'm there and that I am Miles as a grown-up. So it was a very easy experience for me, a very stress-free experience for me. And I could just kind of go on set and have a good time meeting, you know, Mike Flanagan, I'm a huge fan of his work. So it was great. I could just kind of go on and, you know, have conversations with him about his work and see the set of a show that I was already a fan of. So it was a very stress-free and just a really pleasant experience kid in a candy store type thing you're just there yeah and everything you love. yeah just like kind of walking around on set because <laughs> i don't have to think a lot between setups and takes about like well, how am i going to remember my lines for the next thing and or what am i going to do with this or run my lines with my co-actors i could just <laughs> take it very easy <laughs> it seems you've done a lot of that kind of genre stuff do you have a preference in terms of what roles you'll go for or is it just whatever you can get your hands on but is there 
anything you like to play more than others. I remember George Clooney was asked why he would do what they call Return of the Kill of Tomatoes or something like that <laughs> early days in his career. And his answer is like, because I booked the fucking job. <laughs> Still, to an extent, I feel that. But that aside, I don't know if I have a preferred genre to act in. Vancouver has a lot of... I've heard that the skies in Vancouver, because we, we get a lot of moody, doomy-looking skies, that attracts a lot of sci-fi, especially, I've heard. And no, there is a lot of sci-fi filming here. And everything in the Arrowverse films here, it's, I'm yeah. sure it's also because the actors sometimes appear on different shows, so it's a lot easier if they're all filming in the same city. But I don't know if I have a preferred genre. I do love, like I said earlier, I do love sci-fi and period because I love seeing the sets and I love getting into these costumes and that kind of thing is a huge fun experience. But I also like gritty drama. I watch a lot of HBO or HBO style TV shows. That could still be genre, but just the gritty kind of drama they often have. And as far as characters go, I think at the moment I'm really enjoying playing characters that I feel are nothing like me. I have a couple of characters coming up I can't say a lot about, but I would hope they are very different from me because they're not <laughs> particularly pleasant people. And I, I enjoy that a lot of just kind of exploring sides of myself that I don't usually present. I aspire to be a kind and helpful and engaging kind of person, but I love exploring the darker sides of myself and of human nature when I'm acting. I think that's really interesting. What kind of prep goes into that? How do you sort of research those less than pleasant roles and dig into that side of, well, not side of yourself, but that side of human nature, I guess? It can vary. I always do a lot of research. I think that's probably from my journalism background. I rely, I don't know if I rely heavily on research, but it definitely supports me a lot. And that could depend on what the character is. If it's a serial killer, I'll watch documentaries on different serial killers and try to figure out which one even if it's not a, a real life one, but which one kind of feels most like the one I'm playing. And oftentimes, if the dialogue is written and there's some kind of really repulsive dialogue, just saying the dialogue is often, I mean, certain dialogue you can't say in a pleasant way. Cause even if you say it in a pleasant way, that might be even creepier. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I mean, often a good script will definitely help, but I like researching a lot and just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, often I find there's a lot of power in stillness in that kind of character. You know, I'm going to kill you, a line like that. If I say that and just look you dead in the eye and don't blink and don't smile and maybe speak in a lower register, if I don't move, then from a technical point of view, that's kind of all I need to do. You asked also about exploring that in myself. I always try to find something that I have in common with the character, even if it's the most despicable character, just something. It helps me feel I'm not playing a caricature or a parody or that kind of thing. Often it's like a vulnerability thing. I mentioned my mom has Alzheimer's, so sometimes I might put in a certain character that I'm playing that he feels very vulnerable if anyone says something bad mouthing his mother, then that makes me feel something that I can give to the character then I give to the story, for example. But I don't have any one way of preparing. It really depends on the role and, and the show. There are certain things I always do, but there's always a lot of fluidity and, and perhaps less scientific sides of it that I discover in the process. Legends of Tomorrow, you played David Bowie. A historical celebrity what was the audition process for that like how was it auditioning to be david bowie <laughs> i would actually lie if i said i always dreamt of doing that because that's another one of those things that i did never cross my mind that i might play david bowie i have dreamt of playing a rock star or a musician because i used to play a lot of music so i i've definitely dreamt of doing that but not <laughs> specifically as playing david bowie who's I'm a huge fan of, I always have been a huge fan of, and who's so iconic and so recognizable, and yet also a total chameleon with all these different looks and faces. And yeah, auditioning for that, I got the main scene that I played in the season six opener was the same scene I auditioned with. The main difference actually being that I didn't have a melody for the song. I had to make up a melody. And of course, with auditions, again, at least over here, it's it's usually like I get an offer to audition for the part, and then I have 24 hours to send in a tape. So I had to figure out, obviously, all the technical stuff of how does David Bowie sound, how does he move, and learning the lines, and figuring out what I want to do with the scene, and then on top of that, creating a melody for, <laughs> for this fictional Bowie song. 
So that was a lot of excitement for me at once, both in terms of I need to write a song or write a melody that supports my voice in sounding the most Bowie I can. And I also need to be able to play it on the guitar. I can play a little bit of guitar, but I'm not like a virtuoso by any means. <laughs> yeah. And then it was kind of, I think the biggest hurdle for me was after recording a couple of takes, just trusting whichever one I thought was best and just trusting it's that's Bowie enough. You don't have to do anything more to make it more Bowie. It's good enough as it is. It was one that I found difficult to stop recording more takes for and just trust that I've done my prep. It's good enough. Let them see that and let them judge now. Did it help that it was playing him in his undiscovered phase before he became big? Because he's just like an attendee at a gig, isn't he? At the point you're playing him. I felt for a long time in my prep that I was just kind of doing mimicry and a bit of a parody. And I wanted to just break out of the feeling of that. It's one scene and it's David Bowie just kind of having a good time. And because of the nature of the show, I decided to make him a little bit spacey, just a little bit. It seemed to suit the show, I thought, and it was fun to do. And and again, it is David Bowie is having a good time when we meet him at Legends of Tomorrow. So one thing that really helped me was actually an, an acting coach of mine that I was preparing the audition with, I was really struggling to find my purpose in the scene. I work a lot with having an objective, knowing what I want from the other person in the scene that kind of helps me drive the scene forward as the actor. And that was the biggest struggle for me. And he said, oh, you want to write the best song you can, because I'm fiddling with that Space Girl song. I'm trying to figure out the melody and the lyrics. And that really loosened me up and got me out of feeling like a robotic version of David Bowie and could just kind of okay, now I have a reason to be speaking to this guy and I'm not just overthinking, I'm David Bowie, I'm David Bowie, I'm David Bowie. And that was really, really helpful just to have something I wanted from this other person in the scene. And you got to share screen time with the whole cast, or it looks like you do. I don't know if the reaction shots were filmed separately of the lineup of no, the rest of them or no, not. No, I did. We managed to be able to, when we filmed that scene with that whole cast there, that was the very first day that the production of Legends of Tomorrow was back after the COVID lockdown. And of course, there's still a lot of restrictions and mask and distance and all this stuff. But it was the first day that everyone was back and we were able to get all the actors in there in a safe and responsible way. So that was really great. Also, quite nerve wracking to <laughs> be like, welcome back, play and sound like David Bowie in front of the lead cast. <laughs> <laughs> They made me feel so comfortable with that and just actually were excited about doing a scene with David Bowie. They were excited about that. So that was really exciting for me. And there was such a positive vibe in the crew as well, because everyone was just honestly so grateful to be able to go to work. Yeah, I can imagine. And is Dominic Purcell as intimidating as he seems on the show <laughs> to be around? No, it's funny. It's funny that line where he, I can't remember what he says exactly, but like, Oh, shut up! Or something like that. Yeah. He was ad libbing different variations on that in each take and just giving me a different, quiet, different <laughs> versions of him telling me to shut up, which was really, we had a lot of fun with that. No, he's a very nice guy and he doesn't talk in that, like, he does, that's not his yeah. normal speaking voice. It's kind of funny, too, because that character is so rough around the edges and kind of always grumpy and a little bit loud and American. And then in between takes in the green room where the actors wait while they're setting up new shots, this kind of normal sounding Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> and it must have been a blast being on that set. I mean, the show is so much fun. It just brings me joy week on week. So I imagine it's just a blast to see that all put together, or just the lunacy that they're creating. There's been for, I don't even know, 20, 25 years, all the superhero movies and superhero TV shows and just all the blockbusters and all these popular shows based on all the different comic books have done so well. But I do find, to me, they tend to become predictable because it's kind of a repetition of the same story often. But what I love about Legends of Tomorrow is that it's just wildly unpredictable because there doesn't seem to be any rules in that writer's room. Anything goes. They just bring the most ludicrous ideas in. And it's obviously, it has a comedic undertone to, I guess, support all this lunacy. It's as fun as it looks, that's for sure. And, you know, it's great too with that particular kind of show like that. That's just a 
fun show to watch that the actors show up prepared and they're top professionals, but they don't take themselves too seriously. There's no divas on that show. Yeah, it's great. When I review it, I often refer to it as a workplace comedy that has time travel and superheroes. It seems to be the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best description because entire episodes will go by where you don't see a single superpower. They're just rushing about or you're dressed up and doing stuff. Well, even in mine, they're all in that like late 70s kind of punk look. And then the following episode, they're working at a burger joint in the 50s. So, <laughs> And then a singing competition in the most recent episode. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> and what was it like for you adapting to working under COVID restrictions? I can't imagine it was an easy adjustment to make, especially, obviously, it would be great being on set again and getting to work and being able to do that safely. But I imagine the adjustment it takes some doing, the testing and all that stuff. For me personally, there was adjustment to be, you know, there's a lot of testing and everyone other than the actors wear masks 100% of the time, except during lunch, but then everyone's spaced out. And then for me as the actor, I wear a mask at all times, except when we're ready to film. And other kind of practical changes was usually you can go over to the crafty where there's a lot of food and before covid you would just take a handful of nuts and take a little bit of this and that and now there are people there asking what do you want and they'll give you a little bag with stuff just to so that not 100 different people's fingers go in the same uh, nut jar i mean that's probably a good thing to continue with anyway (laughs) (laughs) probably so again i feel like for the actor for me as the actor anyway it's not like a big difference there's just like little practical things you learn new rules like that But honestly, I think the biggest difference would be for some of the crew, because often we'll film a scene from one kind of angle and we might move the camera closer and further away and do movement with the camera and whatnot. But then once all that's filmed, all the actors will leave and then they'll move everything so they can film it from the opposite angle. So they have to move all the lights on the other side and all this stuff, which just takes time to physically do that. And in the past, they could change everything all at once, move the lights and the camera and like move everything all at once. But now they have to kind of space it out so they don't have too many people too close to each other at any given time. So again, it goes down to practical stuff. I might have to wait a little bit longer between these setups, but I think mostly I'm just really grateful to be able to work again. And in my case, I've been lucky to work on some bigger roles than I have in the past. On the subject of COVID, there's Trigger Me, which I was reading about on IMDb. It seems like quite an interesting Mm -hmm. idea. From what I could gather, it was sort of done over Zoom. So acting over Zoom, that that must be an interesting thing to try. Yeah, my role in that show, I was recording, I think in my bedroom, certainly at home. And it was recorded over Zoom. Not all of it was recorded over Zoom, but a lot of it is one of the main characters interacting with other people over Zoom because the show takes place during COVID. It's not about COVID and it's not about a raging virus. It's about all these other things that's happening and they happen to happen during COVID. It seems it's about mental issues and adjusting to things and things like that. I think that's Mm. an important thing to address during all this as well because there has been a lot of trials for people's mental health. I think we've all been feeling it. If you haven't been, you're the strongest person on earth probably. Yeah. It's probably a very important thing to address at this point. It's the, you know, here's what this is doing to us, kind of, even if it's not directly connected to it. It must feel important to just be dealing with those issues in this kind of setting. Yeah, I think so. I agree with that. I mean, I guess that's a positive thing to have come out of COVID is actually that it seems more acceptable to talk about emotional stress and and mental issues than perhaps it did a couple of years ago. It feels like less of a taboo now, I think. Yeah. Because like you said, we've all experienced it now to some extent. (laughs) However we deal with it, there's something to deal with, that's for sure. And yeah, no, I think this show does really well in, in terms of getting into that. Because again, it's not like these characters have issues because of COVID, but they're just tenfold because they can't deal with them the way they normally would because they're confined because of COVID. What's next for you that you can talk about? I know you said there's a couple of things you're not allowed to talk about, but is there Mm. anything you can talk about that we can watch out for? Another David Bowie appearance, perchance, maybe at the wedding? (laughs) Yeah, there might be more David Bowie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the show is not completely done with Bowie. Oh, cool. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah. Anything else? I've filmed a bunch of episodes for the upcoming season of Motherland Fort Salem. Over here, it's a freeform show. I think it might be Disney Plus in the UK. It kind of takes place in an alternate reality where 
there are witches. And these witches, instead of all being murdered in the trials back in medieval times, they actually became part of or became the U.S. military because they have these powers. Well, that's kind of the setup of the show. And then the show follows, in particular, three young witches who are at this witches military academy and and learning some of the skills needed to be a soldier. And yeah, I'll be joining season two of that show. Another one I can't say a lot about because season one mostly takes place in this academy training facility. And then in season two, we move more out in the outside world and the fans get to see what the outside world, what this universe kind of looks like. And I'm part of the outside world. Sounds like a fun concept. I might just check that out if I can get hold of it if it's on Disney+. Plus. I think it is in the UK. It's one of those where it's been bought in, the, in other countries. It's Amazon Prime, so I'm not yeah. quite sure. It'll be somewhere. Just look for yeah. it. You'll find yeah, it yeah. somewhere. <laughs> Tonally, it's a bit more like maybe early seasons of Arrow, Darkerland Legends. And then I've got another Netflix thing coming up. I don't know what I can say without giving anything away. It's almost like when I did The Haunting of Bly Manor, I couldn't say what I was playing because it would give away the ending of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, similar but different to that where I, I can't really say what it is. But yeah, some things that I will be excited to talk about when I'm allowed to. I wouldn't want to get you in trouble with spoiling things. <laughs> no, not no. worth it. <laughs> no, no, not at all. The last question is one we ask everybody is because it's a nerdy superhero-ish focused podcast. What superpower would you like to have if you could have anyone and why? Oh, I have an answer. I thought of an answer and I have an answer, but I also feel like if you ask me in a week, I might think of something else, but (laughs) (laughs) it's one of those. But I think aside what it would do to the world population, I like the idea of having like a healing power because it goes back to it would be like a wonderful thing to heal my mother's disease for example it it feels good to help people and to be able to heal people it would be a power that would just make me feel really good and then of course sort of zooming out on a larger scale it's it might not be that great of a power because you know then the world will be more overpopulated than it is so (laughs) (laughs) but in my own little fantasy world that would be a cool power it's a very noble one as well but you'd have to I guess seriously think about how often you're going to use it. Well, that's the thing. I think I would abuse it in the sense that if my loved ones are sick, I would use it even if it's their time. That's a tough one. And it's no more noble than if I would do it because it makes me feel good. <laughs> There's no such thing as a selfless good deed, as you say. I don't know how true that no, is, but not, it probably isn't. I don't know if this is true, but I remember there's a story that someone asked Mother Teresa when she was doing all this work and by choice kind of living in poverty, how do you become so selfless? And she said, oh, I'm not selfless. This makes me feel great. I feel so good about myself <laughs> doing this. <laughs> and I think there's definitely truth to that. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely is. Eh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's been great talking to you about all your projects and your experiences on big CW shows and all that stuff. It's been great chatting to you. It's been really interesting hearing your perspective on different things. Oh, thank you. It was great chatting with you. All the best for your future projects. Good luck with everything that you've got coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was my chat with Thomas Nicholson. I'd like to once again wish him all the best with his future projects. I really do hope that he succeeds in everything he's working on. If you like what you heard, then don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any major podcasting app. Apple users, please leave us a star rating and a review. If you want to discuss DC's Legends of Tomorrow, this interview, or anything else, then you can find us on Facebook and Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, I hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod.